This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. Support this podcast by joining the independent progressive media revolution today at humanistreport.com. Welcome to the Humanist Report podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 105th episode of the program. Today is July 28th, and before we get into the news, I want to take a moment to thank all of these kind individuals that decided to support us either through Patreon or PayPal. So this week, we want to send shout outs to David Palladian, Esteban Darnay, Gary Nutt, Halette Salazar, John Lloyd, Linda Liu, Lorna D. Rockwell, Patrick Windler, Paula Isella, Rachel Joyner, The Renegade of Funk, Ryan Albert, and Sean Knight. So big thanks to all of these individuals that decided to support us. Uh, If you'd also like to join them and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can visit patreon.com slash humanistreport, Or you can go to humanistreport.com and see how you can support us through PayPal. So on today's episode, first, we'll talk about the current status of healthcare in America and what the hell is actually going on in Washington, D.C. when it comes to Trump care and Obamacare and what may or may not happen. Also, so-called progressive Democrat Ruben Kiewin is now lying about single-payer healthcare. So we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about how the Democratic Party is trying to rebrand themselves, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai's refusal to listen to Americans, Trump's ban on transgender individuals serving in the military, a new scandal involving Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and also how Nina Turner was mistreated by the DNC yet again. And also in this episode, I'll tell you about a new insidious bill with bipartisan support that's making its way through Congress and how it threatens the First Amendment. And finally, in this episode, even though net neutrality is still currently the law of the land, Verizon was already busted violating net neutrality. So all of these topics will be covered in today's episode. Let's go ahead and jump right in, because even though I don't have too many topics to cover, uh, we're going to really go in depth with some of these here. So, um, you know, let's waste no time. Enjoy the episode. On Tuesday, Vice President Mike Pence casted a tie-breaking vote in the Senate to advance some version of Trump care. Now, this vote came a week after we learned that the Senate version of the House Republican bill failed to pass because uh, it couldn't muster enough Republican support. Now, what this vote signals is that while Republicans don't know what they ultimately want to replace the Affordable Care Act with, They do want to move forward with something that could replace the ACA or just repeal the ACA alone without replacing it. So this vote demonstrates that the party is getting desperate because they promised to repeal the ACA. And after failing to sell us not one, but two Republican health care plans, now what they're going to do basically is just throw a bunch of plans against the wall and see what sticks. So... Either way, we know that in the end, if they do in fact pass anything, we're going to get screwed. So protesters on the day that this vote was casted had the perfect message for Senate Republicans. After the Asian age. After the Asian age. Sergeant Arms will restore order in the chamber. Sergeant Arms will restore order in the chamber, please. Now, the protesters that you heard there are telling Republicans, kill the bill, don't kill us, because so far, whatever health care plan that they've come up with results in millions upon millions of Americans losing their health insurance. So regardless of what happens, the Republican Party is desperate to get it done. So the party even pressured Senator John McCain to come back to D.C. while he was literally recovering from surgery after he was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of brain cancer, as you all know, because, you know, they wanted him to be the tie-breaking vote. And John McCain actually did make it back to D.C. and was welcomed back by his Senate colleagues as a hero with a standing ovation, where he then ultimately voted to strip health care away from millions of Americans after receiving the best care that money can buy for himself. What's his moral barometer? Where is it? It's nowhere. So 
after he casted this vote, presumably for partisan reasons, he then gave what um, <laughs> mainstream media pundits would refer to as a rousing speech, uh, where he then talked about the need for bipartisanship. Our deliberations can still be important and useful, but I think we'd all agree they haven't been overburdened by greatness lately. No shit. So after this vote took place, President Trump then took a moment to announce how the Republican Party just voted to successfully fuck over the average American voter. I'm very happy to announce that with zero of the Democrats' votes, the motion to proceed on health care has just passed. And now we move forward towards truly great health care for the American people. We look forward to that. Great. So we're moving forward on a bill that will provide us with truly great health care. Now, what exactly does that entail? Well, he doesn't know. We don't know. Nobody really knows yet. He just knows that whatever they come up with, uh, if it does get passed, it's going to be truly great health care, even though whatever plan they've proposed thus far results in millions of people losing their coverage. That's not my opinion. That's based on the nonpartisan CBO scores. But I mean, you, you just got to trust them here, guys. He doesn't know what they're going to pass, but it's going to be truly great health care because Donald Trump says so. Now, on Wednesday, Senate Republicans voted on whether or not to just repeal the Affordable Care Act altogether with no replacement plan. And thankfully, that was defeated in a 45 to 55 vote. And one GOP senator even announced his intention to introduce a sham single payer amendment to distract everyone on the left and say, well, look, you have the Democratic Party, you know, we we gave them the option of single payer and X amount of Democrats voted against it. So they really want us to be divided and stop fighting Trump and fight each other right now. So it's actually pretty clever, uh, but it's a sham amendment and it really doesn't matter who does or doesn't vote for it. In fact, Bernie Sanders said that he will not be voting for it and instead will be proposing his own single payer bill. Uh, but I mean, what they're doing now, nobody really knows precisely what's happening because the whole process has just become so convoluted and there's so many bills being considered. Uh, so at this point, we'll hear from a senator who is going to try to break down what exactly is going on now. I think I could say without any hesitancy that there's nobody in the United States Senate who has a clue what's going on or what will go on. Uh, what Trump thinks is a great step forward uh, is part of his belief that we should throw 22 million people off of health insurance, raise premiums for older workers, and cut Medicaid by $800 billion. That's not what the American people think is a great step forward. What I think is there's so much confusion and disagreement within the Republican ranks that what they may end up doing is coming together on a much, much narrower bill. It would be a bill that perhaps repeals the individual mandate, repeals the employer mandate, uh, repeals the tax on medical devices. And then if they could pass that, and by the way, there's no guarantee that they can pass that. If they could pass that, they, they would then go to conference committee with the House. But this narrow bill is very, very different from the disastrous bill in the House. And whether they could reach agreement and how long that would take, frankly, nobody knows. So now what they're trying to do is meet somewhere between full repeal and partial repeal, as Bernie Sanders alluded to. Now, Scott Newman of NPR explains Republicans are looking at a so-called skinny repeal that would surgically remove some key provisions from Obamacare while leaving the rest intact, at least for now. The skinny repeal would take out requirements for individuals and employers to get health insurance, a feature that is central to the Affordable Care Act's goal of expanding risk pools and lowering costs. The GOP plan would get rid of the medical device tax intended as a revenue source to fund the current health law. The proposal would also eliminate a public health fund provision. Senators have already rejected the Better Care Reconciliation Act replacement plan and a repeal-only proposal so far. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office has said the Better Care Reconciliation Act would have left 22 million more people uninsured by 2026, whereas simply repealing Obamacare without an immediate replacement would have resulted in 32 million more without health care insurance in the same time frame. The CBO estimated on Wednesday at the request of Democrats that a skinny repeal Appeal could result in 16 million more uninsured. So as I sit here trying to put together this segment to tell you what the hell is going on with healthcare in America, 
we got another update. So this skinny build that I just told you about, well, it was defeated literally as I'm sitting here trying to edit this video. So according to The Hill, Senator John McCain killed the last resort Senate Republican health care bill in a surprise vote early Friday morning, voting against a pared down proposal that GOP leaders released only hours earlier. Now, here's my absolute favorite part about the update. McConnell appeared almost distraught after McCain's surprise vote and seemed close to choking up on the floor after falling short of his promise to repeal Obamacare. This is clearly a disappointing moment, he said. Oh, the tears of unfathomable sadness. Mm, yummy, yummy, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'm going to leave you with what Lindsey Graham said about the so-called skinny repeal, and then we'll get back to the original segment that I recorded. We've been asked by our leadership for days now to vote on the least common denominator, the skinny bill, because the pitch is if you vote for this skinny bill, then we can go to conference, then we can get my bill scored, we can get Ted Cruz's bill scored, we can get other people's bills scored that has promise of you know maybe bringing us together, but they're not ready to be they're they're not scored yet. That makes eminent sense to me, with one condition: we actually go to conference. There's increasing concern on my part and others that what the House will do is take whatever we pass, the so-called skinny bill, not take it to conference, go directly to the House floor vote on it, and that goes to the president's desk with the argument, this is better than doing nothing. Here's my response. The skinny bill as policy is a disaster. The skinny bill as a replacement for Obamacare is a fraud. The skinny bill is a vehicle to get in conference to find a replacement. It is not a replacement in of itself. The policy is terrible because you eliminate the individual employer mandate, which we all want eliminated, but we actually have a overall solution to the problem of Obamacare. So you're going to have increased premiums, and most of Obamacare stays in place if the skinny bill becomes law. Not only do we not replace Obamacare, we politically own the collapse of health care. I'd rather get out of the way and let it collapse than have a half-ass approach where it is now our problem. So we're not going to do that with our vote. So their ultimate goal is to minimize the total amount of individuals that will lose their health insurance as a result of whatever atrocity of a bill they come up with. Because whatever they're going to propose, it's going to result in people losing their health insurance coverage. That, that's what's going to happen if you repeal the Affordable Care Act. So they're trying to bring down that number and strip away as much of the Affordable Care Act as they possibly can while not doing too much damage or at least just enough to where they're still electorally viable in 2018. And once they finally come up with a plan that will minimize the amount of political blowback they'll receive, then they'll most likely settle on a bill. See, because the goal itself for Republicans, it's not to fix Obamacare so people can actually get coverage because they don't really care about that. The ultimate goal is to repeal it and replace it with some shittier option just so that way they can check off the one legislative achievement that they claim they would accomplish prior to retaking control of government. But either way, whatever they come up with, we can anticipate that we're all going to be getting fucked over. Lots of us are going to lose insurance coverage if they do in fact agree on a bill. But thankfully, there's some really clever senators like Jeff Merkley who are trying to throw a wrench in their plans by proposing hundreds of amendments to stall the process. So at this point, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen, but we know that uh, we're going to see a lot of different iterations of Trump care or Ryan care, whatever you want to call it. But the goal is to strip away Obamacare, chip away at it as much as they possibly can to where the consequences won't be overwhelmingly negative, but still negative, you know, just again, so that way they can check off one legislative achievement. It, it's really, it shows their true agenda because Republicans don't care about the American people. They don't care about expanding health coverage. All they care about is appeasing their donors in the health insurance industry 
and trying to do something legislatively. I mean, they just want one victory under their belt. And of course, they want it to be the one thing that they boasted about for the last eight years. They claimed they would repeal the Affordable Care Act and they want to make sure they get it done because if they don't, they look more incompetent than we already know they are. So look, at the end of the day, now is the time to put pressure on your senators and let them know that we are not going to approve of any repeal, be it full or skinny, that makes Americans lose health insurance. The only answer is single payer. We're about expanding coverage, not going backwards. So whatever these scumbag Republicans come up with, We've got to fight them tooth and nail, and we do have time. We don't know what's going to happen, but we have time to fight them. So now is the time for you to make some calls. Even though it's the case that President Donald Trump on the campaign trail promised to take care of veterans, he recently gave thousands of people currently serving in the military the middle finger by making this announcement on Twitter. So he states, after consultation with my generals and military experts, please be advised that the United States government will not accept or allow transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military. Our military must be focused on decisive and overwhelming victory and cannot be burdened with the tremendous medical costs and disruption that transgender in the military would entail. Now, if the justification he's using here sounds familiar, well, that's because it's the same line of reasoning we used to justify Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was a ban on gays and lesbians serving openly in the military that was repealed back in, uh, I believe, 2010. So look, let me just state before we even go further, transgender people will win the right to serve openly in the military. And what Trump is doing here is just delaying the inevitable. But the line of reasoning he is citing here, uh, it's bullshit. So when he talks about the so-called disruption and uh, the medical expenses, well, first of all, the military's budget is already bloated, so I think that they can handle any and all medical costs of those serving. And also, second of all, Zach Ford of Think Progress puts the cost into perspective for us. Current military spending on ED drugs is about 10 times higher than the estimated cost for the military to cover transition-related surgeries and other treatment. The Military Times previously reported that in 2014, the Defense Department spent a total of 84.24 million on ED prescriptions. Of that, 41.6 million was specifically spent on Viagra. According to the Defense Health Agency, between 2004 and 2013, the number of service members diagnosed with ED doubled, the equivalent of approximately 10,000 new diagnoses each year. Comparatively, the RAND Corporation estimates that allowing transgender people to serve in the military would raise defense health spending by between 2.4 million and 8.4 million, an increase of 0.04 to 0.13 percent in expenditures. Transition-related care is medically necessary for transgender people, but does not impede their ability to serve. So really, this isn't about the disruption that transgender people would cause. It's not about the medical costs. This is a decision that was based exclusively on Trump's bigotry. He doesn't like transgender people, and he pretended to be an ally to the LGBT community, when in actuality, he dislikes members of the LGBT community, and this proves it right here. And when it comes to joining the military, what Donald Trump is doing here is he's excluding transgender Americans who are actually willing to serve from the plethora of benefits one gets from joining the military, including the opportunity to travel and acquire new skills and acquire educational opportunities, retirement opportunities, job opportunities. And when you join the military, you can actually purchase a home with no money down using a VA loan. So there's all these benefits that someone would get if they want to join the military that Trump is now excluding them from. And Trump is now saying, if you're transgender, you don't get to serve in our military. You don't get any of these benefits that other people who choose to serve in the military receive. Now, what's odd about this decision is it fails to take into account the thousands of people already serving in the military that are transgender. So what are we going to do with them? Are we going to kick them out of the military? I mean, what are the implications? Well, of course, we don't know because like all of Trump's plans, this is another half-assed plan. Do we kick them out if we find out they're transgender? Are they required to come forward and reveal uh, their birth sex? I mean, what 
is the actual implications here. So look, I'm not transgender, but it's important that we share insight from people from the community. So Business Insider explains a retired Navy SEAL Team 6 hero who is transgender had a message for President Donald Trump after he announced the U.S. military would bar transgender people from serving. Let's meet face to face and you tell me I'm not worthy, Kristen Beck, a 20-year veteran of the Navy SEALs, told Business Insider on Wednesday. Transgender doesn't matter. Do your service. Being transgender doesn't affect anyone else, Beck said. We are liberty's light. If you can't defend that for everyone that's an American citizen, that's not right. Now, additionally, in an op-ed for the New York Times, another transgender veteran, Chelsea Manning, wrote this. This is about bias and prejudice. This is about systemic discrimination, like the integration of people of color and women in the past. This is a sign of progress that threatens the social order, and the president is reacting against that progress. We are neither disruptive nor expensive. We are human beings, and we will not be erased or ignored. So I think that's really the perfect way to put it. These are human beings, and you are denying them their humanity because they're transgender, and that to me is immoral. It's reprehensible. And the good thing, I mean, I guess the silver lining, if you could take anything away from this, is that people are really starting to wake up. One person in particular, Caitlyn Jenner, who deluded herself into thinking that Trump actually cared about transgender people, is beginning to realize that he doesn't give a damn about you. But I do want to take a moment here to give credit to someone who I usually don't give credit to, John McCain. So, Back when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was still on the books and when we were fighting to repeal it, John McCain was one of the most vocal advocates for Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and he actually has come out against Trump here. So CNN reports that John McCain released a statement about Trump's announcement saying, The statement was unclear. The Department of Defense has already decided to allow currently serving transgender individuals to stay in the military, and many are serving honorably today. Any American who meets current medical and readiness standards should be allowed to continue serving, the Arizona Republic and said in a statement. There's no reason to force service members who are able to fight, train, and deploy to leave the military. Regardless of their gender identity, we should all be guided by the principle that any American who wants to serve our country and is able to meet the standards should have the opportunity to do so and should be treated as the patriots they are. So, John McCain saw the light, at least on this one issue. This week, he still voted to strip healthcare away from millions of Americans, so that's its own separate story, but at least he saw the issue on this. So, credit where credit is do. But getting back to Donald Trump, what Donald Trump did here is unacceptable. It's just a brazenly bigoted thing. He is the definition of a regressive. I mean, right-wingers like to talk about the so-called regressive left, but really, this is one of the most regressive things you can do. What Donald Trump is doing is he's taking a wrecking, wrecking ball, and he's trying to undo what little progress we made on a ton of different issues. It's not just LGBT rights. I mean, he's rolling back any progress we've made with respect to climate change and healthcare, and it's not like we've taken giant leaps that we need to, but he's just undoing what little progress we've made. And it's just, it's shameful. But Donald Trump has no shame. He's proven that time and again. So history will judge Donald Trump accordingly. Uh, he will be looked back on as a bigoted asshole president who did something that harms a community that is no different than anyone else. They're human beings. I thought the right, you know, they, they talk about snowflakes and being triggered. Well, if you're triggered by someone who is transgender, then maybe you need to look in the mirror. Maybe you're the real snowflake if you're against transgender people. Because who gives a shit if someone is transgender? I don't care. If they're willing to serve, let them serve. This, this is just so unnecessary, and you're only prolonging the inevitable. Transgender people will have the right to serve. So in unnecessarily banning them from serving, Donald Trump is just making the history books or giving them <laughs> more ammunition against him. So if you're a progressive, then you already know that the Democratic Party establishment currently is facing a huge conundrum. So they know that they have to rebrand and come up with some type of pseudo-populist platform in order to appeal to the voters that they neglected and abandoned over the course of the last couple of decades. But the problem is that if they truly move in a populist direction and move to the left, then that's going to alienate some of their wealthy mega donors. So what they're really doing right now is they're trying to walk on this tightrope. They want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to convince us that they actually give a damn about us while still being corrupt and taking money from large multinational corporations. But you can't have it both ways. 
but the Democratic Party nonetheless is trying to have it both ways. And their problem is that they're already alienating donors because they've become so unpopular that their electoral prospects are looking worse every single day. And as a result, wealthy donors don't want to waste money on a party that always loses, which is why they've had a difficult time raising money over the course of the last couple of months. Now, for a political party, if your mega donors start jumping ship, then obviously you turn to the grassroots portion for fundraising. But the Democratic Party's problem is that they've pissed off so many progressives and so many grassroots activists that they have a better chance at getting blood from a tulip than raising money from progressives. So Chuck Schumer knows this, and he knows that the party has got to change. So over the course of the last couple of weeks, they've been rolling out some new changes. And one of the first changes that they're doing is... They're actually, for the first time in what seems like decades, they're trying to be introspective and they're trying to talk about the real reasons why they lost. So in an interview with the Washington Post, Chuck Schumer, who is currently the Senate Minority Leader, told them that, quote, when you lose to somebody who has a 40% popularity, you don't blame other things. Comey, Russia. You blame yourself. So what did we do wrong? People didn't know what we stood for, just that we were against Trump and still believe that. So what he's saying there is absolutely true. I mean, if you lose to a reality TV show star, you don't get to blame anybody but yourself. That's an easy election. That's a cakewalk. You blame yourself. So that's a good first step. I mean, looking within and seeing what you did wrong is a good thing to do. Now, additionally, besides being a little bit introspective, they decided to roll out a new slogan. Now, of course, I told you about some of their shitty options that the DCCC floated, such as, I mean, <laughs> have you seen the other guys? So what do they have now? So the new slogan is a better deal, better skills, better jobs, better wages. Now, if that slogan makes you feel hungry, <laughs> oddly enough, <laughs> then it's because it may sound familiar to something we've heard before. Better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John. So, so they've worked on that slogan for months. They tested it in focus groups and the best they can come up with is a Papa John, <laughs> a Papa John's light slogan. I mean, you can't make this shit up. And it's not just me being a douche and saying, oh, that sounds like Papa John's. I mean, one of the titles on a Newsweek article published recently is that the Democrats are stealing Papa John's slogan for 2018. So, so clearly, I mean, the slogan is terrible for a multitude of reasons. It is vague. It doesn't state what they want. And if they're really trying to make it like a play on FDR's New Deal then just saying a better deal doesn't mean very much because you're basically just saying, well, you know, we know that you have a shitty deal. Ours is slightly better. I mean, what what type of message does that really say to voters? Do you honestly think that's going to energize the base who you abandoned? Of course it's not. But putting all of that aside, Chuck Schumer took the time to talk about their new platform that they are currently rolling out, which is a better deal platform. And he kind of gave us some insight uh, into what they are going to be offering us. Week after week, month after month, we're going to roll out specific pieces here that are quite different than the Democratic Party you heard in the past. We were too cautious. We were too namby-pamby. This is sharp, bold, and will appeal Some. to both the old Obama coalition, let's say the young lady who's just getting out of college, and the Democratic voters who deserted us for Trump, the blue-collar worker. Some may wonder... Economics, George, is our strength. Some may wonder we are if gonna it's going to go be at it. bold enough. I mm -hmm. mean, even your New York colleague, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, talking about health care, says if you really want to get prices down, you have to health care. Will Democrats unify behind single-payer health care? Well, our economic agenda, we've talked so much about health care that we are not going to address that in this agenda. We've been talking about it. And let me just say, the first thing we're going to do should, first, I think that this, uh, the Trump care will not pass. It just is you think rotten. it's dead? I think it's very unlikely to pass because it's rotten to the core. People are not for reducing taxes on rich people or getting rid of Medicaid, which is a uh, very, very um, middle class now uh, thing, as well as for poor people. 
So the first things we're going to propose, if the Repub and the Republicans hopefully will join us once they abandon this rotten bill, is some cost sharing, which the insurance companies say will help bring down premiums and stabilize the market. Something else that Republicans have often supported, uh, which is reinsurance proposed by Tom Carper and Tim Kaine. And Claire McCaskill's proposed something in the Bear counties, B-A-R-E. You can, if you can't get insurance in those counties, you can get the same kind of health insurance we get. Then we're going to look at broader things. Single payer is one of them. So that is on uh, the table? Medicare. Well, sure, many things are on the table. Medicare for people above 55 is on the table. A buy-in to Medicare is on the table. Buy-in to Medicaid is on the table. On the broader issues, we will start examining them once we stabilize the system. And our Republican colleagues have said, should even Mitch McConnell alluded to the fact that should uh, their bill fail, they'll work with us on these first stabilization things. Then Democrats and Republicans will have different ideas, should sit down and talk about how we can improve the system. And the one thing we insist on, we not do what they did, which is just 10 Republicans, four Republicans in a room, not even including us, regular order, hearings, committees, go through the process. But on this agenda, we are going to really shake things up. All right, so he states there that in the past, Democrats have been too nabby-pamby, they've been too cautious, and, you know, with this new platform, it's going to be sharp and bold, and that all sounds really fantastic to me. However, when it comes to the question of single-payer, what was it that, uh... Chuck Schumer said about that again? Well, sure, many things are on the table. That doesn't sound sharp or bold to me, Chuck. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like a cop-out. Because what you're trying to do, and it's very transparent, you're trying to give yourself enough wiggle room to pander to those of us who want single-payer while allowing yourself to weasel out of it and not actually support single-payer. But since his response to single-payer and whether or not the party would support it was not bold and not sharp, TYT's Naomi Lachance gave him a second opportunity to answer whether or not he's in favor of single payer. Excuse me, my name is Naomi Lachance. I'm a reporter with TYT Politics. How realistic do you think single payer system is? Well, it'll be when it, once we kill this bill, we'll move on and see what's good. There are a lot of good ideas on the table. Do you think single payer would be a one good them, idea? It's one of them on the table. Thank you. So it's on the table. <laughs> in other words, no, we don't support single payer. That does not sound very bold to me. But honestly, if you thought that that was a bad answer, I'm going to show you a clip from another bold Democrat who Naomi Lachance asked the same question to. Excuse me. Hi, my name's Naomi Lachance. I'm a reporter with you know TYT Politics. Uh, right, no, um, what do you think is the likelihood of single payer working Sorry, um, as right a now. solution? So uh, you're not going to say anything about single uh, payer as right people now, are... How bold of you, Al Franken? refusing to answer a simple question about single payer. How, what a bold party. Wow. I mean, they've been too nabby pamby in the past, but now, I mean, this is this is them being bold right here, everyone. I mean, it, it's just embarrassing. But the reason why they're not giving us a straight answer is because we know where they stand. They don't support single payer. In fact, let's hear from another bold Democrat who gave us some insight into the party's true intentions when it comes to health care. But I've been very clear about my desire to work with them and my desire to compromise. They want, as far as I can tell, flexibility of benefit design. They want something that has some cheaper premiums, less regulations uh, in these exchanges. I'm willing to talk to them about that. I'm willing to give them some flexibility of benefit design if they're willing to give us some security on these exchanges that Donald Trump won't unwind them. There is a legitimate compromise to be had here. And I think Democrats are willing to bend, but they have to throw out yeah. this process and come and work with us in regular order, like John McCain told them to yesterday. There is a legitimate compromise to be had here. I think Democrats are willing to bend. Is that so? So uh, let's recall again how Chuck Schumer described Democrats before. We were too cautious. We were too namby-pamby. That's right. So they were too namby-pamby. And now you have Chris Murphy here, a Senate Democrat, saying that the party is, quote, willing to bend and that there's a legitimate compromise to be made with the Republicans who are extremists who want to strip health care away from us and that the party, you know, they're, they're willing to bend. That sounds 
Like the opposite of bold. That sounds like you guys are weak and you're rolling over and dying in typical Democratic Party fashion. I mean, what's it going to take? You're willing to compromise here with extremists. And when you compromise with the Republican Party who want to strip health care away from citizens, you're forced to meet them somewhere in the middle. But if you're not even willing to start with single pair, can you guess where you're actually going to end up? on their side to the right so in the end we'll end up with something worse than obamacare if we actually allow the democrats to negotiate with republicans so that's how the democratic party is choosing to rebrand themselves they're putting lipstick on a pig and telling us that they're different when really they're just as nabby pamby as they's, they've always been i mean nothing has really changed here but getting to more of their a better deal platform sarah jones of new republic explains the democratic party's better deal isn't that great according to schumer democrats hope to give small business tax credits to retrain unemployed workers they have also pledged to fight for a 15 dollar minimum wage regulate prescription drug prices and bust monopolies at vox jeff stein notes that this is something of a populist turn for the party and the party does deserve praise for affirming its commitment to a 15 dollars minimum wage and a crackdown on monopolies and mounting prescription drug costs the latter two planks will require democrats to buck a number of corporate donors a demonstration of political courage for the working class however this better deal is insufficient it does not mention medicare for all or another approach to genuine universal health care it does not mention student loan debt or a campaign against right to work laws those details may be released at some later date in his editorial schumer implies that more information is forthcoming but their omission doesn't exactly inspire confidence in the party's progressive vision the plan's name itself is something of a tell this isn't a modern new deal it does not challenge many of the structural imbalances responsible for our shoddy social welfare system and it can't as long as democrats boast of refusing to expand federal government the better deal is indeed just what it says it is better but not great not yet so this isn't a bold platform in fact there's a particular word that i would use personally to describe this platform but i can't think of it maybe chuck schuber can help me out namby pamby ah that's right it's namby pamby and the democratic party has always been weak they've always been nabby pandy they they've always been too cautious and that's never going to change so now it's up to organizations like our revolution justice democrats brand new congress draft bernie to actually take over and push the left in a new direction because the democratic party is broken and they will remain broken at least until they get new leadership but currently the new direction that they're purporting to take us in as a joke. I mean, you cannot honestly look us in the eyes and tell us with a straight face that you're moving in a new populist direction if you won't even get on board unequivocally with Medicare for all. So the party needs to know that that is the true litmus test. If you want to talk about purity tests, Medicare for all is it. We don't support people as progressives. We don't support people who don't support Medicare for all. So if you want to actually win in 2018, get on board with Medicare for all because that is the true purity test so if you want to whine about purity test that's it and you just failed the biggest one so actually take a stand don't be namby pamby and support medicare for all and a vision that's truly bold if you ever want a shot at taking back anything in government again FCC Chairman Ajit Pai has maintained that he wants to roll back Title II net neutrality regulations because these regulations are overly burdensome. They not just stifle innovation, but they also hurt small businesses. And he also states that he wants to remove these regulations because he believes that the internet should be free and open. Now, if his line of reasoning makes no sense to you, you're not alone because currently businesses on the internet are thriving they're doing great and furthermore the internet is already free and open in fact don't take my word for it try it try going to any website you could think of and if you're able to access that website without receiving a message popping up from your isp telling you that this website isn't currently included in your broadband package then the internet is free and open so the reason why ajit pai's reasoning doesn't make sense is because he's lying to you.
He's trying to obfuscate the truth about what net neutrality is and does because he previously worked for Verizon. He was an attorney for Verizon. And Verizon is a company that will profit heavily if net neutrality is repealed. And when he ultimately ruins the internet and then leaves the FCC, you can bet that they'll likely offer him an even better job than he had before with the nice hiring bonus. So back in May, the FCC voted to repeal Title II net neutrality regulations, and currently they are undergoing a process where they have to listen to feedback from the public. And the public has submitted an unprecedented amount of comments to the FCC at nearly 13 million more than ever before and most of them tell Ajit Pai to leave the internet alone. But even though those comments along with public opinion polls show that the overwhelming majority of the American people disprove of Ajit Pai's pro-corporate agenda, well recently he basically tacitly admitted that there's nothing we can do to change his mind. So Ars Technica reports that in an exchange between Ajit Pai and Democratic lawmaker Michael Doyle, he asked Pai what kind of comment would cause you to change your mind. Pai responded, economic analysis that shows credibly that there's infrastructure investment that has increased dramatically since the net neutrality rules went into effect. Pai said he also would take evidence seriously if it shows that the overall economy would suffer from a net neutrality rollback or that startups and consumers can't thrive without the existing rules. Advocacy group Free Press has presented an analysis that it says shows a 5% increase in ISP investment during the two-year period after the net neutrality vote and capital increases at 16 of 24 publicly traded ISPs, but Pi has expressed disdain for Free Press, calling it a spectacularly misnamed Beltway lobbying group that demands government control over the internet. Meanwhile, different studies that showed investment declines have been cited favorably by Pi. Doyle yesterday also asked FCC Commissioner Michael O'Reilly, a Republican, if anything would stop him from voting for a net neutrality rollback. I'm looking to the record to see if anything changes my mind. I'm looking for substantive comments, O'Reilly said. When asked for an example of a quote, substantive comment, O'Reilly said economic analysis and real evidence of harm to consumers versus some of the material I've been getting. While there are millions of comments, many of those comments are empty and devoid of any value, O'Reilly said. So in other words, Nothing is going to change their mind. He says he's looked at some of the comments that we submitted and he thinks that they're devoid of value. So we're telling him, leave the internet alone. And he's saying, well, these aren't substantive concerns. Even though we don't want you to roll out this pro-corporate agenda, they are going to do it anyway. So there's nothing that we can do to appease them. When you give them the evidence they're looking for, they attack the source. And this is because they have an agenda. They have a pro-corporate agenda that is wholly motivated by profit. And it's why a GPI can't come up with a single reason that's actually legitimate as to why we should be rolling back Title II net neutrality regulations. So in front of the Senate Commerce Committee, Senator Marquis asked Pai what problem he's trying to fix by repealing net neutrality rules. Pai responded by saying, one of the concerns we have raised is these regulations might be dampening infrastructure investment. They might be, but there's no evidence of it, Marquis fired back. So again, all that we are getting from the FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, and the FCC commissioner, Michael O'Reilly, it's just lies and obfuscation. They don't know how to do anything but lie. It's lie, lie, lie. Lie after lie after lie. And it's really becoming tiresome at this point. They can't give us anything. And as a result of the FCC being so corrupt and lacking so much transparency, they are now paying the price. They're being sued. So Del Cameron of Gizmodo reports the Federal Communications Commission is being sued over its failure to adhere to a federal transparency law and for wrongfully withholding agency records about net neutrality from the public. American Oversight, a legal watchdog group formed this year to expose conflicts and fraud in the Trump's administration's executive departments, filed a lawsuit Tuesday morning against the FCC for failing to comply with provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. Led by a former State Department attorney, the group is asking a federal judge in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia to compel the release of records concerning the FCC's plans to gut net neutrality. 
the FCC has made it clear that they're ignoring feedback from the general public, the group's executive director, Austin Evers, told Gizmodo. So we're going to court to find out who they're actually listening to about net neutrality. If the Trump administration is going to let industry lobbyists rewrite the rules of the internet for millions of Americans, we're going to make them do it in full view of the public. So the FCC has gone rogue. They want to go against the overwhelming majority of the American people and kill net neutrality at the behest of these large internet service providers that will profit heavily and offer these FCC scumbags jobs. Uh, so at this point, it's just everything that they're saying is a farce. They've offered us no good reason why net neutrality should be repealed. They're claiming that it stifles innovation and that the internet is no longer free and open. When that's bullshit, it's demonstrably false. Again, don't take my word for it. Go to any website you could think of. The internet is currently free and open, but rolling back Title II net neutrality regulations will make it so that way it's not free and open because internet service providers like Verizon can throttle the bandwidth of competitors like Netflix, which we actually found out that they're already doing. So the FCC is going against the public and they're refusing to listen. So here's what's going to happen. We're already suing them for a lack of transparency, but we are going to sue them if they go through with these anti-American changes. Because look, it should never be the case that a couple of unelected bureaucrats go against the overwhelming majority of the American people. I'm okay with bureaucrats having power if they're actually trying to be attentive to what the American people want, but these guys aren't doing that. They're bought off by the industry. They are so corrupt that they don't care about the consequences. They don't care how repealing net neutrality will harm consumers, will harm businesses, and stifle innovation, and basically hurt everything they claim to care about. So, this has got to be stopped, so it's not too late for you to submit your comment. They may not care about it, but as long as we can keep getting those numbers up, then it just it helps strengthen our case against these clowns in the FCC who are doing the bidding of their corporate overlords. A couple of weeks ago, I told you about a new 2018 congressional candidate named Amy Vallela, who is challenging a corporate Democrat who is a self-proclaimed progressive named Ruben Kiwin, who's currently representing Nevada's 4th Congressional District. Now, Amy is challenging Ruben because... For months now, he has been refusing to listen to the thousands of constituents that have been calling on him to co-sponsor H.R. 676, which, as you all know, is John Conyers' single-payer health care bill. Now, Amy attended a town hall with Representative Kewin over Mother's Day weekend, and she told him the story of her daughter, Shalin. Now, Shalin died, unfortunately, because she was unable to prove that she had medical insurance, and as a result, she was denied basic medical screenings that would have ultimately saved her life. So Amy explained to Ruben that a bill like H.R. 676 would have saved her daughter's life and asked him to co-sponsor it. And his response basically was no. I mean, that wasn't verbatim what he said, but he did the typical corporate Democrat dodge and how we have to defend the ACA and beat around the bush. And really, he has been ignoring voters. So as a result, Amy is challenging him. She's truly going to represent the people in Nevada's 4th District, and she will be co-sponsoring H.R. 676. She's going to do what Ruben won't do. She's going to represent the voters in Nevada's 4th. So now that he has a challenger, I expected one of two responses from Ruben. So the first type of response I expected was that Ruben Keelan would likely finally co-sponsor H.R. 676 because as we've seen with New York's 14th district, well, once it was the case that progressive Democrat Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez announced that she was primarying a corporate Democrat there, Joe Crowley, he then co-sponsored H.R. 676 in that same week. Now, the second type of response that I expected from Ruben was for him to try to double down on his unwillingness to support H.R. 676. And rather than telling us the truth that he's been bought off by the health industry, uh, he instead is going to try to vilify H.R. 676. And, you know, it turns out I was right. He did, in fact, opt for the latter option. So in a Facebook Live town hall he held with Representative Jackie Rosen, 
He pretended to actually care about what his constituents thought when he doesn't, and he took a bunch of questions from them. And as you could have guessed, he received multiple inquiries about HR 676, but before he really addressed HR 676, he wanted to take a moment to really prove to you all that he cares about you. He cares about you getting health insurance, and he knows from firsthand experience how important it is for Americans to receive the health care that they need. Um, we have a few actual, actually a few questions um, regarding the HR 676. Uh, this is the Medicare for All bill uh, sponsored by our colleague John Conyers, mm -hmm. uh, who mm -hmm. by the way is currently the longest serving uh, member mm -hmm. of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's a good friend of ours and uh, we're grateful for all his service uh, in the last few years. Um, you know, look Jackie, I you know, something that I don't share with a lot of people often is that um, three years ago, even though I was a state senator, um, I was uninsured. Um, I was not only uninsured, but I was, I was also unemployed. Uh, and, you know, up until I was 13 years old, uh, my family did not have health insurance. You know, my mom uh, came here to Las Vegas uh, and she joined uh, the MGM Grand as a housekeeper. And thanks to the Culinary Union, uh, when I was 13 years old, I was able to get good health coverage. But up until I was that age, I didn't have any health coverage. Uh, and again, just three years ago, uh, I didn't have health coverage. You know, and it's, it's very difficult because you don't want to go out there and play sports. You don't want to go mm -hmm. out there and, God forbid, you trip and break your hand or, or yeah. a foot. Uh, yeah. You're going to be in debt for the rest of your life. Uh, so part of the reason why when I came into Congress, uh, you know, and I started fighting to protect the Affordable Care Act, was for that same reason, uh, because now we have 24 million more Americans who have mm -hmm. health coverage right. uh, thanks to the Affordable Care Act. Now, is it a perfect bill? Absolutely not. Uh, but this is now where we begin the discussion as to what, what is the next step? Right. Um, how are we going to find coverage for the 11 million people who still don't have health insurance? Again, I've been there, and I understand what it's like. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, right now in Congress, we're going to do everything possible to protect the Affordable Care Act but also start looking into new ways on how to expand that coverage. So we all heard it. Uh, he states, I've been there and I understand what it's like. So he only wants to protect the ACA and expand coverage, but doesn't want to move towards single payer, which would be the ultimate solution to the problem that he's bringing up. I mean, you'd think with the story that he told us there, he would be one of the most vocal proponents of HR 676 because HR 676 makes sure that nobody's left out, but he's not doing that. In fact, in this next clip here, he tries to muddy the waters about HR 676 and he implies that the problem that, you know, he experienced, you know, being unable to get health care when he was 13, you know, that that that's not something that can be solved with HR 676. And he proceeded to just brazenly lie about HR 676 in this next clip. Um, my concern, though, Jackie, with uh, HR 676 is that, you know, it shifts the cost uh, from the corporations down to the to the workers. Mm -hmm. You know, we have right now right. Uh, the majority of our employers right now that are non retirees receive their health coverage uh, through their employer. That's right. And so in, if, if HR 676 were to pass as is, uh, it would shift the cost from, for example, like my mom. Uh, my mom works for the Culinary Union or works for the MGM and is a member of the Culinary Union. It would shift the cost from the MGM grant, which is where she works with the corporation, down to the worker, to her. Uh, and again, and I don't think that's the ideal scenario here. Right. You know, we want to make sure that obviously everybody's paying their fair share but that the cause doesn't shift down to the worker. Uh, and also part of the reason why uh, in the last two years since I've been campaigning for Congress and now that I'm in mm -hmm. Congress, mm -hmm. uh, I supported the public option, uh, which is something that I believe, uh, uh, it, 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 you know, we live in the greatest country, in the most powerful country in the world. You know, it's unacceptable that somebody should not have health insurance. And so I believe uh, that uh, health insurance is a right uh, and I believe that everybody should have an opportunity to have health coverage. Uh, and look, this is uh, a very complex issue uh, that requires a very uh, complex uh, solution. Uh, so it's not something that we can fix from one day to the next. And as long as I'm here in Congress, I will continue making sure that we have a good piece of legislation moving forward uh, to make sure that everybody has health coverage in America. Because we are in the most powerful, richest country in the world. Everybody should have a, uh, health insurance. It should be a right. Okay, so what he's saying there is 
It's just wrong. So he states, my concern with HR 676 is that it shifts the cost from the corporation down to the workers. And he states, the majority of employees that are not retirees receive their health coverage through their employer. Let's accept what he's saying here. Let's accept that everything he's saying about HR 676 is true. Well, that still raises a lot of questions. What about the people who aren't employed? What about the employees that aren't able to get health insurance from their employers? What about the employers like Walmart that instead of just hiring fewer people for more hours, they end up hiring more people and schedule them for less hours. And they say, look, if you go over 30 hours, we're going to write you up or fire you because then we have to start offering you benefits like health coverage. Are you going to... Think about those people who are being screwed over by their employers who don't want to offer them health insurance. What about the employers like Hobby Lobby that don't want to cover certain healthcare necessities, specifically when it comes to women's health? What about them? And also, he's acting like employers subsidize 100% of the costs when they don't. You still have to pay your monthly premium, whereas with Medicare for All, we all pay a little bit more in taxes, but we don't have to pay monthly premiums or deductibles. But he's not telling you about that. He's trying to make it seem as though you're going to be paying more when in actuality you're going to have more money in your pockets because if you don't have to pay for your monthly premiums and you don't have to pay high deductibles even if your taxes go up a little bit because we have a single payer system you're still going to have more money in your pocket as a result of you not paying your monthly premium now he also says here it's unacceptable that somebody should not have health insurance and adds i believe health insurance is all right so he's telling you all this about how it's really important, you know, he, he couldn't get health insurance until he was 13 and he wants to make sure that health insurance is right. But let's really examine what he's saying here, because I think it's very interesting. And really, when you dive into it, it's telling, actually, by saying that health insurance is a right. That's very different than the rhetoric he used on the campaign trail. So under the ironically titled Ensuring Healthcare for All Americans tab, which he doesn't support and pretends to, uh, it's on the issues page of his campaign website. He states his belief that health care is a basic human right that must be protected. But here in this video, he's saying that health insurance is a right. Now, at face value, that may seem like a benign semantical difference, but providing everyone with health care and providing everyone with health insurance are two very different goals. To give everyone health care means that you give them what they need no if ands or buts if they need health care if they need a surgery that costs millions of dollars for example hypothetically you get them that care that they need however to give everyone health insurance means that you have a private insurance company that is profit driven that gets to stipulate the amount of care you actually receive so they may provide you with health care insofar as you know, what you need falls within the plan that you pay for. But in reality, your insurance provider isn't going to pay for everything. If you need a surgery, for example, they could only cover a certain portion of it and make you cover the rest, even though you're paying your monthly premium. The point is that giving everyone health care and health insurance, those are two very different things. Now, that may sound like I'm being a nitpicky person here, you know, who's just trying to argue based on semantics. But understand that Ruben Kiwin is a very smart individual and he knows the difference between health insurance or health care. If he doesn't know the difference, then he probably shouldn't be speaking about this issue and he should probably resign immediately because that distinction is very important and notice that Ruben Kiwin here after campaigning on health care as a human right is now moving the goalposts he's now saying that he only believes in health insurance as a basic human right here's what it comes down to it's very simple if you truly believe that health care is a basic human right and that nobody should be left behind 100% of American citizens should receive health care then you would co-sponsor HR 676 because it does just that. And if, for example, you think that HR 676 is imperfect, well, that's all the more reason to jump on board with it and co-sponsor it because then that gives you the opportunity to offer amendments to HR 676 and perfect it in the way that you want it to be perfected. But instead, Ruben Kiwan here is lying to his constituents about HR 676 and he's pretending to be on their side when he's not. Ruben Kiwan doesn't want to tell you about the fact that he accepted thousands upon thousands of dollars from the health industry, specifically health industry packs and hospitals. So by lying here, he's actually defending his donor's interests. And while Ruben Kiwin has already raised more than $500,000 
for his 2018 campaign, more than half of which has come from super PACs, Amy Valela is not taking any PAC money. She is pledged to run a people-powered campaign, and if you really want to defeat a corporate Democrat like Ruben Kiewen, you can help Amy out. Go to amyforthepeople.com, send her a donation, even if you can offer nothing more than a dollar. That helps. That helps defeat someone like Ruben Kiewen, who is now just straight up lying about Medicare for All, because it's very clear he's not going to support it. He's doubling down, uh, and he's now trying to uh, pretend to still be on our side when he's doing something that is brazenly against the will of his constituents. They want him to co-sponsor H.R. 676, and instead he's choosing to go in the opposite direction and is now lying about it. We need to kick him out of office. We need to make an example out of Ruben Kiwin. And let's elect Amy Valela, someone who actually cares about the people and who will co-sponsor H.R. 676 on day one. So today I want to do something that I typically don't do on the show. I actually want to read the Constitution to you guys. So let's look at the First Amendment. It states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. Remember those words, freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, even though many Americans claim to know more about the Constitution than they actually do. I mean, the First Amendment is universally recognized. I mean, people on the left and the right, they know what the First Amendment is for the most part, and they know what it means and what it does and how freedom of speech is crucial to not just American democracy, but democracies everywhere. And in fact, many political scientists use freedom of speech as one of the indicators of democracy. So it's it's incredibly important. But there's currently a bill being floated through Congress that brazenly violates freedom of speech. And the rate to which this bill is gaining steam should scare everyone. So as you all know, there's a growing international movement known as BDS, which encourages boycott, divestment, and sanctions on Israel. And this is in protest of their illegal occupation of Palestine. Now, regardless of how you feel about the BDS movement, it's a nonviolent way of protesting Israel's violation of international law. And it's a similar strategy that was employed to end apartheid in South Africa. But when it comes to this movement, Congress is now trying to impose penalties on those of us that support the movement. So Glenn Greenwald and Ryan Grimm of The Intercept explain a group of 43 senators, 23 Republicans, and 14 Democrats wants to implement a law that would make it a felony for Americans to support the international boycott against Israel, which was launched in protest of that country's decades-old occupation of Palestine. The two primary sponsors of the bill are Democrat Ben Cardin of Maryland and Republican Rob Portman of Ohio. Perhaps the most shocking aspect is the punishment. Anyone guilty of violating the prohibitions will face a minimum civil penalty of $250,000 and a maximum criminal penalty of 1 million and 20 years in prison. The proposed measure, called the Israeli Anti-Boycott Act, was introduced by Cardin on March 23rd. The bill's co-sponsors include the senior Democrat in Washington, Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, his New York colleague Kirsten Gillibrand, and several of the Senate's more liberal members such as Ron John Wyden of Oregon, Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, and Maria Cantwell of Washington. Illustrating the bipartisanship that AIPAC typically summons, it also includes several of the most right-wing senators such as Ted Cruz of Texas, Ben Sass of Nebraska, and Marco Rubio of Florida. A similar measure was introduced in the House on the same date by two Republicans and one Democrat. It has already amassed 234 co-sponsors, 63 Democrats, and 174 Republicans. As in the Senate, APAC has assembled an impressive ideological diversity among supporters, predictably including many of the most right-wing House members, Jason Chaffetz, Liz Cheney, Peter King, along with the second-ranking Democrat in the House, Steny Hoyer. Among the co-sponsors of the bill are several of the politicians who have become political celebrities by positioning themselves as media leaders of the anti-Trump resistance, including three California House members who have become heroes to Democrats and staples of the cable news circuit. 
Ted Lieu, Adam Schiff, and Eric Stalwell. These politicians who have built a wide public following by posturing as opponents of authoritarianism are sponsoring one of the most oppressive and authoritarian bills that has pended before Congress in quite some time. Let's take a moment to pause and really think about what we just read. This is straight up authoritarianism. I mean, let's read the penalty again. Anyone guilty of violating the prohibitions will face a minimum civil penalty of $250,000 and a maximum criminal penalty of 1 million and 20 years in prison. We're no longer in illiberal territory in pseudo-democratic territory. This is overtly authoritarian legislation here. So my question is, where are all of the free speech crusaders? Why haven't we heard from people like Dave Rubin, who claim to care about free speech? I mean, do people who are so-called free speech crusaders only care about free speech when it's convenient for them? When they can talk about free speech and not be attacked by the right-wing audiences? I mean, why is it that free speech is so important to some people, but it's only talked about once in a while? I mean, is this not one of the most brazen violations of free speech? This is unbelievable, but look, moving on, I want to actually name and shame some of the more prominent people who you and I will be more familiar with. So in the Senate here, we have Marco Rubio, Democrat Robert Menendez, Orrin Hatch, Dean Heller, Maria Cantwell, another Democrat, Chuck Schumer, Joni Ernst, Kirsten Gillibrand, Joe Manchin, of course, Claire McCaskill, Oregon's Ron Wyden, a Democrat, Tom Cotton, and in the House, we have Democrat Brad Sherman, of course, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Jackie Rosen, another Democrat, Chris Collins, Adam Schiff, Peter King, Matt Gates, Louis Gohmert, Greg Walden, and there's a lot more supporters of this authoritarian bill on this list, but I'll link you to the uh, the bills themselves, both in the Senate and the House, so that way you can see if your senator or representative is supporting this bill, and if so, I would implore you to call them immediately because this is unacceptable. Now, what these anti-democratic people who co-sponsored uh, this bill didn't realize was that this bill garnered quite a bit of backlash. In fact, the ACLU came out to sharply denounce it, and once it garnered a lot of backlash, well, now they're starting to backpedal a little bit. So, The Intercept reports, the ACLU warned last week that the measure which targets the BDS movement was unconstitutional and would have a chilling effect on free speech. In the wake of that warning and a subsequent article by The Intercept, co-sponsors of the bill have begun to re-examine their support for it. Cardin said that the ACLU had misrepresented his legislation, but if it needed to be clarified, he would take steps to do so. A lot of the co-sponsors are pretty strongly committed to the freedom of speech, Cardin said. Yeah, right. We're certainly sensitive to the issues they raise. If we have to make it clearer, we'll make it clearer. We thought we only dealt with civil penalties, not criminal penalties, Cardin told The Intercept. But if that's not clear, we're willing to deal with these issues. If the bill were amended to clarify that no criminal penalties could be applied, violators would still face a 250000 civil fine or more. Cardin also said that individual American citizens who backed the boycott of Israel would face no legal consequences and made that point in a letter penned with co-sponsor Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, which was sent to colleagues on Friday. But the text of the bill bans actions, quote, which have the effect of furthering or supporting restrictive trade practices or boycotts fostered or imposed by any international governmental organization against Israel or requests to impose restrictive trade policies or boycotts by any international governmental organization against Israel. Yeah, so what it sounds like to me is that this bill garnered a lot more attention than they had anticipated, and now they're trying to muddy the waters a little bit. We have Ben Cardin, one of the sponsors of the bill, playing dumb, saying, oh, I didn't know that it included criminal penalties, even though the bill has criminal penalties. He's saying, you know, our goal was to only impose uh, civil penalties, not criminal penalties. I mean, how brazen can you get? It's very clear. They're transparent. And now that they were busted supporting this authoritarian bill, now they're trying to backtrack a little bit. And a bunch of Democratic senators who supported this are coming out to assure us that they care about the First Amendment. We're looking at it, McCaskill told The Intercept. Blumenthal said he's open to changes. They have some legitimate concerns, and I want to sit down with them, he said. The bill may need to be amended. Wyden, a co-sponsor, said that he was encouraged that Cardin and Portman had put out a letter outlining how it protects the First Amendment, he said. Obviously, I feel very strongly about the First Amendment. And at a recent town hall event in New York, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand took some heat from constituents. 
not only not support such a bill, but to come out in opposition to it and to urge your colleagues to do the same. This is not what I as a Jew wish for. It is not what the world needs. What we need is support for the rights for Palestinian people, peace in Palestine, peace in Israel. Credit to all of these Democrats for actually responding to criticism, but I don't buy it. They're saying, well, Kirsten Gillibrand here, she said that, you know, this was just an extension of foreign policy in my reading of the bill, and it only extended to companies. But I mean, you have criminal uh, charges in here. How would you jail a company for 20 years? And I love how they're talking about freedom of speech, uh, you know, at least now within the context of freedom of speech applying to companies, but yet we allow companies the freedom of speech to buy off politicians, but when it comes to supporting BDS, we're trying to curtail freedom of speech in that regard? Look, this is all very clear. These guys are transparent as hell. Uh, they were busted. They supported an authoritarian bill and didn't think we would pay attention to it uh, and didn't think that the ACLU would be as vocal as they are. And now they're trying to walk back everything that they did in support of this bill. And it's just, it's so shameless. So we'll see what amendments they offer to this bill, but I've never seen a more brazen violation of the First Amendment than this insidious bill right here. So we've got to do what we can to defeat it. So what I'm about to tell you guys will probably shock you to your cores. There's a brand new scandal in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Shocking, right? You know, another day, another scandal. So this is nothing new. But if you had to guess who is involved in this scandal, uh, the new one I'm about to tell you about, name a couple of names. Who is it? Tom Price, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. It's the latter, you know, it's one of the usual suspects. So currently, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is tied to a scandal involving a Democratic IT guy or the family of a Democratic IT guy named Imran Awan. Now, according to John Bowden of The Hill, he reports that a House IT aide working for Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the former DNC chairwoman, was arrested this week on bank fraud charges while trying to leave the country. Fox News reported that Imran Awan was arrested Monday Monday night at the Dole's International Airport in Virginia, about 30 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. Awan, an IT staffer who has worked for many House Democrats and was employed by Wasserman Schultz, was allegedly at the center of a scheme that involved double-charging the House for IT equipment and may also have exposed House information online, according to Fox. Mr. Awan previously served as an employee in our office, but his services have been terminated, Wasserman Schultz's spokesman David Dameron said in a statement. Awan and his family have reportedly worked for House Democrats for years. He declared bankruptcy in 
in 2012, but has made millions of dollars on the House payroll over at least a decade of work for various members, according to a Politico report. In March, a group of House Democrats fired Awan and one other staffer over their alleged involvement in the scheme and the looming criminal investigation. However, Fox News reported Tuesday that Wasserman Schultz still has Awan on her staff's payroll despite him being barred from accessing the House's computer system since February. A spokesman for Wasserman Schultz's office told Politico in March that Awan worked for the staff in an advisory role providing advice on technology issues. Now, Forbes adds that Democrats are being understandably quiet about the Hill staffer, who had been employed by Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz as of Tuesday morning, but has now reportedly been fired. Politico has reported that Awan is at the center of a criminal investigation, potentially impacting dozens of lawmakers. Awan was arrested after wiring $283,000 from the Congressional Federal Credit Union to Pakistan, says the Daily Caller. So, under Understand here, this is a huge scandal, and overall, the Awan brothers are incredibly shady characters, but details about this case are still sparse. But to go over some of the accusations here against them, they've been accused of committing life insurance fraud, and they had access to emails from Democrats and DNC staffers, and one of the Awan brothers even had access to Debbie Wasserman Schultz's iPad password. Now, what's odd is that the FBI actually seized hard drives from the home of one of the Awan brothers, and they smashed those hard drives. They were trying to destroy evidence. So this family was on the payroll of W. Wasserman Schultz. They were literally making millions of dollars, uh, and then they were smashing hard drives. And it's very clear that they were trying to destroy evidence of what was possibly a corrupt deal that involved them or Democrats or evidence of fraud. But the most interesting aspect of the story is how Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, you know, going against her better judgment, if she even has judgment at all, you know, when all of the other Democrats distanced themselves from the Awan brothers once we knew that they were being investigated back in February, she decided to keep them on anyway. Now... At this point, we don't know why that's the case. All we can do is speculate and say, you know, maybe it's the case that she kept them on because since they had access to her iPad and her emails and this, the emails of DNC staffers, maybe they had dirt on her and she wanted to make sure that she didn't piss them off, which is why their family was receiving millions of dollars to work for Democrats and Debbie Wasserman Schultz specifically. So, Again, that's speculation, and we don't have a lot of details at this point, but the entire situation is very weird, to say the least. So again, just to reiterate, Imran Awan was accused of theft back in February. He was banned from House computers, and when all the other Democrats decided to jump ship on Awan, Debbie Wasserman Schultz did not. Now, on top of that, another weird thing happened back in May. So, Capitol Police found a laptop that belonged to Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and they didn't give it back to her right away. And this is because Imran Awan was being investigated. So, it could have been potential evidence in their investigation. And upon learning about Capitol Police's finding, Debbie Wasserman Schultz made it no secret that she was very anxious to get this laptop back. And then lastly, I'd like to know how Capitol Police handle um, equipment that belongs to a member or a staffer that's been lost within the Capitol complex and found or recovered by one of your officers. What happens? Sure. Well, it's processed on, a, on, a, on a, what's called a PD-81, which is a, which is a, a, a property record. And depending on the property, depending on how it's, if you can legitimately uh, determine ownership, then uh, it's generally turned back over to the, to the owner of the property. If there's if, if it's part of uh, of an ongoing case, then there are other things that have to occur for that to happen. So, if a member says that they have equipment that's been lost and you find it, it would be returned to the member. In a general sense, yes. Okay. It has to, you have to identify. You have to be able to positively identify the property and be able to establish ownership. Right. And, and if ownership is established, if it's part of an ongoing case, then there are additional things that need to be done. But if the member owns the equipment and there is no ongoing case related to that member, then the equipment is supposed to be returned. Right. In, 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 in a general sense, yes. If no, I mean in a specific sense. If the member loses the equipment, says they lose the equipment, yes, and it is found by the Capitol Police, it is supposed to be returned. If ownership has been established, right. it will be returned. If it's subject uh, to an ongoing investigation, there are additional things okay. that need to be turned But it, not an ongoing investigation, 
related to the member. If the equipment belongs to the member, it has been lost. They say it's been lost and it's been identified as that member's and the Capitol Police is supposed to return it. Correct? Well, it's not a, a I can't give a yes or no answer on that because I know It's a simple yes or no answer. Well, if you lose if if I, if a member loses the equipment yes, and it is found by the Capitol Police or your staff and it is identified as that member member's equipment and the member is not associated with any case and that is their equipment it is supposed to be returned yes or no depends on the circumstances uh, and if the circumstances I, are I, I don't understand how that's possible members equipment is members equipment that is not it is not it, under my understanding the Capitol Police is not able to confiscate members equipment when the member is not under investigation it is their equipment and it's supposed to be returned well, I think there's extenuating circumstances in this case, and I think I think that you know working through my counsel and um, you know the necessary personnel, if if that in fact is the case, and you know, with the permission of through the investigation, then we'll return the equipment. But until that's accomplished, I can't return the equipment. I think you're violating the rules when you when you conduct your business that way, and should expect that there would be consequences. I yield back. So you might have missed it there, but towards the end of the clip, she threatened him with consequences if he didn't give her back the laptop. Now, understand, this is Capitol Police. It's not like uh, these are shady characters who are going to take her laptop and, you know, take it home and use it for themselves. I mean, it's it's being used for an investigation. They're going to look at the evidence on the laptop, if there's any evidence for it, and then they'll give it back to you. So the only reason why she would be so anxious to get the laptop back, presumably, is if she didn't want them to see what was on that laptop, if she didn't want them to have any evidence that would potentially aid them in their investigation of Imran Awan and the rest of the Awan family. So, again, we don't have much details yet, and we do have to wait for more information, but at this point, what we can ascertain from what we know is that Debbie Wasserman Schultz is tied to the Awan brothers, at least more so than other Democratic lawmakers, when it comes to her keeping them on the payroll longer than everyone else and she may be implicated in their investigation somehow which is why you know she's trying to get back anything like the laptop that might provide them with evidence into the awan brothers corruption uh, but again we don't know and all we can do at this point is speculate but what we can say is that the entire situation is very very weird as i alluded to so all that i can conclude is uh grab your popcorn boys and girls because this is going to get very interesting our Revolution President Nina Turner went to the DNC headquarters to hand deliver a petition that amassed more than 115,000 signatures that called on the Democratic Party to adopt a people's platform. Now, when she arrived at the DNC, uh, she didn't receive a warm welcome. In fact, they put up barricades to stop her from hand delivering this petition. So I'll go ahead and let Nina Turner explain what happened specifically. When I stepped on this side of the barrier, I was told that I need to step on the other side. And that is indicative of what is wrong with the Democratic Party. I am, I shouldn't need a fancy title, but I thank God that I do have one because I'm able to use my cachet on behalf of the people. But I am an American citizen. I am a member of the DNC from yeah. Ohio. Yeah. I am a former state senator from the great state of Ohio, and I was told that I needed to step on the other side. Now, I don't know how many more titles I need. That's it. But I am a justice warrior for the people. That's it. So I'm told that these barriers are not usually here every day, because my question was, are these barriers here every day? But I'm told that they are here today because of loud, uh, large crowds and the fire marshal, which I do respect. But you don't treat people who have come to deliver the people's platform. We're not violent. We are just regular, everyday citizens from all walks of life trying to have a conversation with the Democratic National Committee. But I'm feeling some kind of way right now. Because if something like this can happen to somebody like me, That's then imagine it. how other people are treated. That's it. That's it. Now the people's platform is about all people. It is about respect and it is about dignity. We approach this building peaceably. We approach this building with respect and love. 
All we are trying to do is deliver the people's platform to the DNC and put the Democratic Party on notice. That's it. That when we say Medicare for all, that's what we mean. When we say justice for all, that's what we mean. When we say environmental justice for all, that's what we mean. Social justice for all, that's what we mean. Political justice for all, that is what we mean. All means all. All means all. And so we have, Madam Director. Yeah. Because <laughs> titles are good. <laughs> but purpose is better. That's it. Over 100,000, 115,000 signatures to the DNC. I wish the chairman could be here to receive those signatures, but he can call his sister up. He got my number. That's it. Yes, there we go. We'll do that. And I hope that he will call me. That's it. And so that we can discuss the summer for progress for all people in the Democratic parties in particular, not exclusively, but in particular, their obligation to honor that progressive platform that we passed around this time last summer. See, we know what you did last summer. That's it. And all we did was pass a platform, but we don't have the requisite number of leaders who are willing to push this platform and forget that lofty perch that they stand on and do something that will matter for generations to come. We are delivering the people's platform and all means all. All means all. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I don't have too much to say about this video, but I wanted to share it so that way we can kind of shine a light on the DNC's inexcusable behavior. Because let me remind you that this is not the first time that the DNC has tried to silence Nina Turner. Because as you all remember, about a year ago, they stopped her from speaking at the DNC convention in Philadelphia. So they don't like Nina Turner. And the reason why they dislike Nina Turner is because Nina Turner is like a giant mirror. She forces them to look within themselves and face all their demons, and they don't want to do that. They know that what she's saying, her message is 100% right. But if they actually adopt the people's platform, then that means that they can't do the bidding of their corporate donors. So they want to do everything they can to silence Nina Turner and turn Nina Turner away when in doing so, they're only... Really, uh, they're putting this wedge between grassroots activists and themselves even more because they need to embrace the grassroots. Nina Turner is the embodiment of progressive grassroots in the company or in the country, and they're just turning her away time and again, and it's pissing us off because Nina Turner, I mean, she's everything that's right with the country, and the DNC represents everything wrong with the country. So in delivering this people's platform to you, she's really, I mean, you should be thanking her because she's giving you democratic leaders a gift. She's telling you all the things that you can adopt that would make you exponentially more popular. And it's not just, you know, about the popularity contest. If you adopt this platform, you would actually be electorally viable for the first time in, I don't know how long. So the democratic party is despicable. Their actions here are reprehensible. And it just shows us that they're willing to shun progressives and they don't want to hear from us. So if you're a Verizon customer recently, you might have noticed that when you try to use Netflix, it seems like the speeds are noticeably slower. However, if you use Verizon's video streaming service, it seems to work just fine. So it's really strange. It's almost as if Verizon is intentionally slowing down Netflix to encourage you to use their video streaming service instead. Now, if you're wondering whether or not they're actually throttling Netflix, well, Chris Welch, a journalist from The Verge, posed this very question and cited evidence that Netflix is much slower on Verizon than other internet service providers. And that article generated a lot of buzz, which forced the company to come out with a response. And they basically admitted yeah, we, we're we throttling Netflix. Even though net neutrality is currently still the law of the land, we're doing it anyway. So Russell Brandom of The Verge reports, yesterday we reported that Verizon Wireless appeared to be throttling Netflix traffic and today the company seems to have come clean. In a statement provided to Ars Technica and The Verge, Verizon implicitly admitted to capping the traffic blaming the issue on a temporary video optimization test. We've been doing network testing over the past few days to optimize the performance of video applications on our network, a Verizon Wireless spokesperson said. The test
testing should be completed shortly. The customer video experience was not affected. This is a really weird statement, seemingly referring to something completely different from what customers actually experienced. What customers saw wasn't optimization, but a clear cap, with tests from Netflix speed test tool showing measurably lower rates than non-Netflix tests. While Netflix was the only service to have a speed test tool producing measurements, it now appears that similar caps were applied to all video applications on the Verizon wireless network. So if you're debating whether or not we should believe what Verizon is saying, the answer is no. Because all this time, as FCC Chairman of GPI has been trying to roll back Title II net neutrality regulations, Verizon is supplying talking points to Republican lawmakers and bureaucrats and doing propaganda on behalf of the FCC to aid Ajit Pai, the current chairman, in this effort to roll back net neutrality regulations. Verizon really wants to roll back net neutrality because they will make millions, potentially billions of dollars uh, in extorting small businesses and offering new, more expensive packages to consumers. And they're already testing the limits of net neutrality by giving preferential treatment to their own video streaming services. So currently, as you all know, Verizon has a data cap. So what they're allowing people is you can use their video streaming service and that doesn't go towards your data. But if you use Netflix or Hulu, uh, a non-Verizon video streaming service, then that goes through your data. So what they're doing is they are prioritizing one con one uh, one business over another, their own business, you know, because this impacts their bottom line. And it's just what they're doing is testing the limits of net neutrality. And they're kind of making sure that when Ajit Pai does ultimately vote to kill net neutrality, they're going to be ready. They're going to know how to cap Netflix or whatever the fuck they do. I don't know what they do, but they they know they're expecting fully for Ajit Pai, their former employee, to deliver. So Verizon is one of the most scumbag companies in the country, right alongside Comcast. And it's very clear that they stand to gain everything from rolling back net neutrality while we gain nothing from it. So we need to share what they're doing here and put them on blast because what they're doing is unacceptable. Net neutrality is the law of the land. So they broke the laws in doing this and now they're lying about it. They're doing a video optimization test. Bullshit. Bullshit. Prove it. And if you can't prove it, then guess what? Looks like Netflix gets to see you in court and sue you because in giving your own service preferential treatment, you are violating the principle of net neutrality. And it's not just the principle. Currently, it's a law. So it's unacceptable. And Verizon's got to pay for it. Well, that's all I got for you guys today. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, as usual, I've got to send a special thank you to anyone who sent us donations through PayPal and who contributes to us monthly on Patreon. You guys really help the show to not just survive, but to thrive and expand. And I've got a lot of exciting things coming to the program. So look, stay tuned. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Have a great day.